So we've been focusing a lot on the teachings of Jesus, uh, especially uh, in regards to the Kingdom of Heaven. And what is the Kingdom of Heaven? What's the Biblical definition of that? Uh, from the words of Jesus. So let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to look at the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is one of the longest recorded teachings of Jesus. And, uh, and so we won't do all of it. Uh, we're just going to focus on the first section. There's actually several sections of this teaching. So we're in Matthew chapter 5, uh, starting with uh, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, uh, Jesus went up on a mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came up to him. So Jesus opened his mouth and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs mm. is the kingdom of heaven. And so this is dealing with the Beatitudes. Beatitudes is, is dealing with the word for blessing. And this word blessing in the Greek, it literally means, uh, it's like happiness and peace. It's a combination of those two concepts. Peace and happiness, it's, a, it's the sense of like uh, contentment. It's probably very similar to the Jewish word shalom, where it's dealing with wholeness. There's a wholeness, there's a contentment uh, that is here. And so Jesus is saying those that are poor in spirit uh, will be blessed. They will come to that place of shalom, contentment, for they will inherit or they will receive the kingdom of heaven. So I want to just explain through what it means to be poor in spirit. And you've got to go back and look at the original Greek words for this. Um, now as we go through the Beatitudes, uh, in fact most of Jesus' teaching on the kingdom, you understand uh, the kingdom of heaven is like an upside down kingdom. It's back to front. It's upside down. It's not. In fact, actually it's right side up. The world's mm -hmm. upside down. Um, but the thing is, it's opposite to the world. Mm -hmm. And so... The kingdom of heaven, uh, if we want to really move in the kingdom of heaven, we're going to learn how to move in the opposite spirit to the spirit of the world. So the spirit of the world is moving in one direction. The spirit of the world values certain behaviors, certain attitudes, certain uh, ways of doing things. And the kingdom of heaven is the opposite. And so, uh, for example, if you want to be first in the kingdom of heaven, then you need to make yourself last. If you want to be the master, you need to become the servant. Uh, so that's in the world, they want to be first, so they make themselves first. They make themselves the leader. They make themselves the master. But in the kingdom of heaven, it's those that come alongside, those that serve, those that empower others. They're the ones that are real leaders, uh, having spiritual authority. So poor in spirit means those who can humbly realize their desperate need for God. This is what it means to be poor in spirit. Is without God, I'm bankrupt. Without God, I'm nothing. So pride, which is based in self, uh, pride will, you know, think I'm pretty special. Uh, I can do it. You know, God's really lucky He's got me. Uh, all of these different things that's in pride, very self-focused. But to be poor in spirit is we realize, really without God, I'm bankrupt. Without God, there's nothing of significance that I can do. I cannot even follow Jesus without the help of God. I need the help of the Holy Spirit of God. If God's not empowering me and helping me, I cannot be the person God's created me to be. Um, so understanding this concept of being totally bankrupt, you might remember... Uh, for those of you in Lions Royal, we went through the seven letters to the seven churches. And uh, in, in the book of Revelation, as we looked at one of the letters to the seven churches, it talks about this one church, they thought that they were rich and they were in need of nothing. And so they were very full of themselves. They're very full of self-confidence. And so did you know self-confidence is ultimately pride? So true biblical Christianity, we're not, self-confidence is not something a true Christian should ever strive for. Mm -hmm. We have to strive for God confidence. Mm -hmm. 
And when you're striving, your confidence is in God, then who you are in God, then you will have confidence in yourself because it's based primarily in who you are in God. It's kind of like when Jesus was teaching, if you want to uh, find your life, you'll lose it. Again, this is strange things that Jesus said, but those that seek after their lives lose it. But those who lose their lives for Jesus' sake will find it. And so in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus is speaking to this church. He says, you guys think you are rich and you need nothing. But I want you to know that you're naked, blind, pitiful and wretched. And so Jesus is showing them spiritually that the, when they're thinking that they have need of nothing, but actually they have great need. Okay. Jesus says, I counsel you, therefore, to buy from me gold that's refined in the fire. Mm. I, and, and because you're, you're poor. So the richness, mm. the riches of the kingdom of heaven is gold that's refined in the fire. And that's speaking many times in scripture, our faith that is refined and purified through trial and testing and hardship. Our faith is better than gold purified in the fire. So the, the gold purified in the fire is dealing with our character and our faith and that the Lord is developing us through all of the different challenges of life and we're learning to have a more Christ-like character. We're learning to be more humble. We're learning to be less of self and more of Christ, etc. And um, so that's a, a picture of a church that was not poor in spirit. And, and so this is dealing with the understanding, yes, with Christ and Christ in me, this is a powerful thing. I'm a son of God. You know, I'm destined to be a king of heaven in Christ. But outside of Christ, I'm nothing. I'm doomed for eternity in hell. Uh, so that's what it means. And so if you study that passage in the book of Revelation, it ends up talking about for that church, if they come and they buy from Christ gold refined in the fire and, and they, they get from him his robes of what righteousness and the, and the salve for the eyes that their eyes would be open to see clearly. And then it says that they will sit on thrones in the kingdom just as Jesus was given a throne from the Father. So those people, they're missing kingdom authority because they think they're rich. They think they're powerful. They think that, you know, God's lucky he's got me and they lose the authority of the kingdom. But when they understand that I'm nothing without him and they get desperate, they hunger and thirst and cry out, I need more of you, God. I need your grace. I need your help. And then you actually now qualify to sit on thrones in the kingdom through those attitudes. And that's why it says... Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is a key of receiving kingdom authority. It's not by lording it over others. It's not by um, promoting yourself. It's really finding your identity fully in Christ. And say, God, without you in my life, I, I can do nothing. I need you. I'm so desperate for you. I'm desperate for your help. I'm desperate for your wisdom. Um, I'm desperate for the authority that flows from you. Right. So the opposite of this, obviously, is spiritual pride, self-sufficiency. Where you know, when you're self-sufficient, I don't need anybody else. And so it's interesting because it's not just I don't need God, but I don't need anybody else. And so I don't need anyone to speak into my life. Thank you very much. I don't need anybody that is going to uh, give me counsel. I don't need anybody to mentor me. I know everything I need to know. Yes, oh, God can tell me because God's God, but I don't want to listen to people. So that attitude, self-sufficiency, it's an independent spirit. Mm. And an independent spirit is where, you know, basically you separate yourself from the need of being dependent on God and others. And so at being poor in spirit, there's a level of dependency. I need brothers and sisters in Christ. I need to be in fellowship. I cannot do this alone. It's like Adam in the garden had a great relationship with God. And God said, this is not good. Because Adam was alone without another human being to have mm. connection with. Yeah. And so that's the other side. And in fact, it says in Scripture 1 John, if you say you love God, but you don't love your neighbor, you're a liar. Mm. 
So we actually see our true relationship with God. Are we really dependent on God? Are we really walking in humility? By whether we can be uh, interdependent in the body of Christ, if we can submit to others, um, that shows that we can submit to God because we're submitting to God through others in the body of Christ. Okay. So the next part of the Beatitudes we look at Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Okay, so this mourning or grieving. Blessed are those who mourn and grieve. So, when Jesus would have originally said this, it would have obviously impacted the original hearers because there's so much, even you think of our own culture, there's so much about self-sufficiency and being self-confident and you've got to boost up your ego and... And all this sort of stuff goes on. And now we're talking about, well, Jesus says, actually, if you're in a place of mourning and grieving, if you're broken of spirit, broken of heart, there's a blessing for you. If you submit that area of your life to the Lord. So there's a potential blessing, which is receiving the comfort of the Lord, when you are grieving and mourning over issues, if you bring those issues to the Lord. Now, it's not a blessing for you just to be grieving and mourning and broken of spirit in self-sufficiency. Okay, this is why then I'm, I need God. I need God to comfort me. I need God to, to strengthen me. I need God to encourage me at the moment. And then I'm, I'm, I'm mourning and grieving, and this is what it's blessed are you mourn and you grieve over sin in your life. So you grieve over what God grieves over. Mm. This is what this is dealing with. It's not self-pity. Self-pity, again, is a self-issue. Self-pity never leads to anything redemptive. Self-pity parties, the devil is always there in the midst of it, and it just, it's just self-pity, self-pity, and you weep and you cry and you never change. And the devil's just going, yeah, just feel bad about yourself all the time. I really love this. And, you know, get down and you never get out of the pit. So self-pity is totally different. Again, it's a self-centered issue. Mm -hmm. But true godly grieving and mourning is when you identify in your life something that is not of God. Some wrong attitude some ungodly belief, some ungodly behavior, unchrist-like behavior. And then you start to say, and, and you can even pray for this, you know, like sometimes you live with yourself for so long, you're used to it, right? It's like, well, you know, like most people say, well, I was born that way. Mm. And so what's happened is they've accepted in their life ungodly behaviors uh, because they say, well, this is my personality. I was born this way. I've always been this way. Uh, so you're never going to get blessed if you have that attitude. Because God has told us to repent of anything that's not of Him. Mm -hmm. And so when you kind of realize you're hearing the Word of God taught or you're studying Scripture and you realize, oh my goodness, my behavior is actually ungodly. I don't feel bad about it. I feel quite good about it, actually. I feel okay about it. But I know that it's wrong. That's it. So you're not grieving, you're not mourning, but you know that it's wrong. So then just by an act of your will, you cry out to God, say, God, I don't mourn over this. I don't grieve over this. I don't have a holy anger against this issue in my life. I ask that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you've caused to dwell in me. And your Holy Spirit grieves over these things. I ask that the grieving of the Holy Spirit would just overwhelm me and that I'd start to be grieving. I ask, Lord, that you would just convict me by your Holy Spirit, that you'd bring my conscience alive back to God again. Because I want, to, I want to grieve and I want to mourn over those things that you grieve and mourn over. So are you following this? It's, so some of these things we go, oh my goodness, this is not me at all. But you can cry out to God for it to be you and God can start to work in your life. And He loves that sort of prayer. He loves it when we cry out for these sort of things. And it's like, um, so the, the mourning and grieving is not just... If you can't mourn and grieve over sin in your own life, you'll usually excuse it in society. And you're not discerning properly. It actually hinders discernment. Um, and so the other thing is the people that are religious pride people, 
They'll see it in everybody else and not themselves. So that's another dynamic. You're judging everybody else because you clearly, quickly see, but you don't, you don't grieve over it for them. The grieving is like, oh Lord, I'm grieving for this person because Lord, they're not gonna be blessed if they, with this in their life. And I care about them so I can't sleep at night. I'm grieving for them, I'm mourning for them, Lord. I'm broken hearted for them. Now, that sort of attitude you're blessed, but usually the plank in the eye people, you see it in everybody and you judge them for it. Sometimes you even hope to see them get judgment of God. And when they get the judgment of God, you kind of feel happy a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I knew that would happen. Okay, so that's not the heart of Jesus at all. That's like the heart of the accuser. Um, but, you know, when you're grieving over it and you're just going, Oh, Lord, that you know they're going to suffer so much in their life unless this changes. I, let's pray for your Holy Spirit to come on them and, and to start to convict them. And this is dealing with the burdens of the Lord. Blessed are those that receive the burdens of the Lord, for they will be comforted. And so, obviously, when you identify issues and you cry out to God, then the Holy Spirit's released. And then the blood of Jesus cleanses you from guilt and shame. And then you get released from the, the grieving and the mourning over something. And you come to that place of peace and content. But also, when you're interceding for others and you're crying out to others, eventually the burden lifts. Now, because you've cast your burden on the Lord, the burden lifts and then you get peace. They might not have changed yet, but you get that peace. And then maybe the, the burden comes back on you again and you just learn how to release that burden to the Lord. And as you keep doing this, then eventually the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind and you're going back into a season of peace. So just to kind of understand how to respond when the grieving in the morning over unrighteousness comes and it can be over what you see in the nation. So turn it into intercession when it's for others. Turn it into personal prayer, requesting God's forgiveness, the cleansing of the blood, repentance prayer, when it's dealing with yourself. Now, there is reaping what you've sown in sin. And there's no blessing for just having guilt and shame because you've sinned. Full stop. There's no blessing in that. You don't get free. You don't get healed. You don't get forgiven. It's only when you now confess this to God and bring it to the Lord and then allow the Lord to deal with it. So some people walking around, you know, that they never really repent and they keep doing the same sinful activity and they keep dealing with their, sh their shame and their guilt. That is not a blessing. Um, Sanctification and cleansing comes from godly mourning. So godly mourning leads to godly repentance. And godly repentance then deals with the issue and then you will get set free. Okay, now let's look at the next one. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now as we look at the history of the world and we look at all of these famous empires and these rulers over nations and usually what happens in human history the people that inherit the earth they inherit the kingdoms you know they're like these mass murderer insane people that they they're very harsh they're very aggressive they're merciless and they're very proud and arrogant and these become the rulers of the earth well that's the way of the world so what we want to do, just like you know, Jesus went up on the mountain and Satan offered him the power and the glory of the kingdoms, if Jesus would bow down and do it Satan's way, and Satan said, I'm not doing it your way. The Father has a path for me to receive the glory of the kingdoms. The kingdoms will be given to me. I will rule the kingdoms of the earth, but it's not going to be by doing it the way of the beast, the way of Satan. It's going to be a different path, a path of Calvary's road, a path of humility, a path of surrender, a path of self-sacrifice, and that will lead to the kingdom. So the word meek in its original meaning, because some people think meekness is weakness. Mm. You know, and you know, we used to joke about meeky mouse, you know, like squeaky little voice and everything. 
Can I tell you that true meekness is not a personality type? Mm. So you can be one of those strong personalities, you talk a lot, you've got a strong voice and everything, and you can be meek. Jesus, when he was meek, cleansed the temple. Mm. And he was rebuking the Pharisees, calling them viper hypocrites, whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones, and he was meek. Mm. Okay, it's not a personality type. Remember when I was in Tibet, mm -hmm. and I met this Tibetan Buddhist Lama, and this Tibetan Buddhist Lama, everyone said how humble and meek he is. And the guy was walking around like, he looked like this and everything. And he's just like, he's so weak. Uh, weak in character, weak in personality. And, but everyone thinks that's meekness. Mm. And, but when I talked to him, I tell you, he was the most proud and arrogant person. He was mm. so stubborn and he was so set in his ways with a self-deception that he thought that he was meek and humble. Mm. Because he actually really believed and he found pride in the fact that he thought that he was meek and humble. You're following this? And, and, and so, the true meekness is dealing, number one, with um, humility. And a good definition of humility is when we see ourselves as God sees us. Humility is acknowledging the truth of God about ourselves. So I can be fully humble and meek and declare I am a son of God. I'm a new creation son of God. I am a king priest of the kingdom of heaven. And I'm destined to rule and reign with Jesus for eternity. I can say all of that. I can say it in pride. Pride's an attitude. But I can say the truth of what God says about me. Some people think that humility is, you know, constantly talking down about yourself. I'm useless. And so this is a bit different when we talk about poor in spirit. Without Christ, I'm useless. That's true. But so I'm totally useless, full stop. I'm a worm. I have no value. You know, people that are constantly condemning themselves and speaking down about themselves. That's not what being poor in spirit is. Poor, being poor in spirit is ultimately acknowledging our need for God and without God we're nothing. And that's not humility either. Humility is really coming out of, I acknowledge the truth. So if there's sin in my life, if there's an ungodly behavior, I acknowledge that. That's it, yeah. I said, that's sin. Mm. That's an ungodly behavior. I was wrong. Okay? You know those people go, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, even when they're right. So that's not humility at all. That's just someone that needs to Inferior. move into true humility. Yeah, that's inferior pride. Mm. True meekness, the word is also linked in with gentleness. So there is a certain area where you are not being bombastic, you're not being arrogant and proud, you're not being aggressive with how you treat people, but there is a gentleness, a genuine concern for people, and a genuine humility. Um... Meekness is dealing with not asserting ourselves over others in order to push through our selfish agenda. Mm -hmm. And th that's all pride, actually. That's, and you can come through. Some people are very manipulative, you know. And yeah. so, you know, if they don't get their own way, then they'll throw a tantrum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'll yell and they'll scream and they'll jump up and down. And then other people, if they don't get their way, they'll start crying. And they'll, they'll, they'll turn on the tears. And, oh, you don't like it. You're going to give in yet. And so there's all sorts of things that we learn in life that are unjust, unfair ways of manipulating people to do what we want. That's it. And so meekness is the opposite of that. Meekness is um, a willingness not to assert our will over others to force them into change. But it's coming alongside gently it's speaking into their lives it's encouraging them it will speak the truth in love but it's not a it's not a manipulation for a, a selfish motive so we call this love with a hook you know well the reason why i care about you so much and the reason that i i'm doing so many things to help you out is i actually want something from you 
And when you don't give me what I want, I get really upset, I get angry, I get frustrated. So that's not true love. That's called love with a hook. Mm. Okay? And, and so meekness is dealing with, you don't have the hook. I actually want to see change in your life because it will bless you and it will benefit you. Um, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you into change. Uh, and when I see you in sin and, 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 and you're in a desperate place where you could really hurt yourself because of this sin, then I'm, I'm going to get quite aggressive in trying to warn you about it. You can do that. That's what Jesus was doing when he's cleansing the temple. He was grieved in the spirit and he's sharing the heart of God. So, how do we inherit the earth? The word inheritance is there. And it's interesting, there's the two paths of inheritance. But one is long. So what often happens is we're always looking for the shortcut. And I'll tell you, the devil always has shortcuts. And the shortcuts will often involve certain levels of compromise in regards to our Christian walk. And so the way of meekness is, and here is a key. Humility and meekness in Scripture is not primarily how you stand before men. It's not primarily how you stand before men. It's how you stand before God. And that's why, you know, Moses, the meekest man that ever lived. And you see, Moses made some very strong stands with Pharaoh. Moses, so it's not a weakness. Jesus made very strong stands against the Pharisees. He made very strong stands against certain sin issues, etc. It's first humility before God so that you can stand with boldness before men. And then, because you're walking in humility before God, then even your boldness is humility before men. Okay? So, some people get the fear of men. And the fear of man is a stumbling block. But they, they, they've got the fear of man, so they come off really... They think humble, but they're not ever addressing or confronting sin issues in people's lives. So that's not biblical humility. No. The prophets were very humble and they confront sin. Mm. They spoke out against un injustice and immorality and unrighteousness. Mm. And so these people that are first and foremost humble and meek before the Lord, which means that they're submitted and yielded to the will of the Lord. They're not arrogantly resisting the will of the Lord in their lives. Yes, sir, yeah. They're surrendering. They say, your will be done, Lord. Whatever the cost, your will be done. That's the people that will inherit from God the earth. Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay, I'm going to skip over blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because it actually links in with some ones that are coming later. Um, but let's look at, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Okay. Let's look at James chapter 2, verse 13. For judgment... Is well without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy will triumph over judgment. So this is sowing and reaping. If you're someone that's constantly judging others without mercy, okay, which means you're judging people without genuine love and concern for that person, then you will reap in your life judgment without mercy. You're going to find that judgments will come into your situation. That the enemy gets empowered to bring certain, uh, there's certain assignments of the enemy to bring judgments and curses into your life because you're showing judgment without mercy. Now, if you're showing judgment with mercy and judgment with love, it's balanced, it's discernment. Okay? And, and discernment is from God. Jesus had discernment and, and, uh, and then he would discern and he would judge things righteously. But. The balance for judgment is we need to have hearts of mercy, compassion, and love. And if you don't have a heart of mercy, compassion, and love behind the judgments or your so-called discernment, and when you confront people, if there's not a genuine love and compassion in your heart for that person, then you're out of Christ-like alignment. 
okay? And then you're, you're going to start to reap that in your own life experience. There's a phrase that's repeated over and over again. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 11 and 13. Matthew chapter 9, verse 11 to 13. Okay. And the Pharisees saw this and they said to the disciples of Jesus, Why does your teacher always eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick need the doctor. Go and learn what it means when it says this in Scripture. I, the Lord, desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so here is Jesus. He's come to, as a friend of sinners because he's like, coming like a doctor. And sin is a sickness. And he wants to heal people of the sin sickness and remove from them the curse of sin. And so Jesus was coming alongside these tax collectors, these sinners, these prostitutes. And he was coming alongside them. And he, he's talking to them. He's praying over them and ministering to them and, and, he's, and he's seeing the value that they have and letting them know that he sees their value. The Pharisees were getting very upset about this and they thought, well, what is if he's such a holy man, why is he spending time with unholy people? Mm-hmm. And so Jesus rebuked them and, and it wasn't one time, several times in Scripture, Jesus quotes this verse from Hosea, that the Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice. Okay, and that word in the Old Testament from the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6, is Hased. Okay, so Lions Royal House of Prayer people, you're going to hear about Hased all the time because mm-hmm. Hased is the Old Testament equivalent to the New Testament agape. Mm-hmm. Right? Agape love. Agape love is not an emotion, it's not a feeling. Uh, they've got filio, which is a Greek word for brotherly love. That's emotional. Mm. Eros, that's uh, a sexual sort of love or attraction that the husband has for his wife, but there's a sexual connotation to eros. Agape is not emotional. It's mm. a choice mm. because of covenant. Because I'm in covenant with the Lord, and the Lord has said, I will do. Mm. I love my wife because I'm in a marriage covenant with her. Even though some days I don't feel like I love her, but I'm in covenant. And so if she says, do you love me? I say, yes, I love you. Because it's not an emotion, Mm -hmm. agape. And so this thing is, God desires, has said, God desires a covenant faithfulness. That we would show uh, the covenant faithfulness, how we would be relating to people. That we would be honoring people because God honors people. And God, and so we are now representing God in how we do things. There is definitely in the words that are used in the Greek, the concept of yeah, showing mercy. Being merciful and compassionate to people. Um, and that's, So if you want to receive that mercy of God, you've got to show mercy to others. Jesus himself said, if you want to be forgiven of your sins by your Father in heaven, then you need to forgive those that have sinned against you. That's showing mercy. If you do not forgive those that have sinned against you, those people that have offended you or disappointed you, if you can't release it and forgive and you keep holding on to it, then what's going to happen is you, you start to hold on to the opposite of mercy. You start to come under a curse of judgment. It starts to make you bitter and resentful and it starts to affect your sleep. It starts to affect your health. It starts to affect how you see yourself and how you see others, and you're not, you're not at peace. That's part of the curse. But when you release it, and release mercy, release forgiveness, then that starts to come back on you, and you start to find the mercy and the forgiveness and the freedom of God. Okay. So let's have a look at the next one. Blessed are the pure in heart... They will see God. Now this is really important for us as believers that we want to really be able to see Him clearly, know Him clearly, 
and hear His voice clearly. Amen? Yeah. And so this is not just about seeing God, it's the eye gate and the ear gate, to be able to see Him and hear Him clearly, but there's often something that's there hindering us seeing and hearing of God clearly, and that's when we do not have a pure heart. If our hearts are impure, it will hinder our ability to, to hear and uh, God clearly and also to you know see we will see God wrong. We'll see a distorted image of God. So the pure heart is a heart that is free from impure motives. Again, we talked about the selfish motive. You know, when you're doing things for others, but you have a selfish agenda why you're doing things for others. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. the love with the hook thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, I want to get personal promotion. I want to be recognized. That's why I'm doing all these good works. Is I want people to recognize me, and I want promotion, and I want people to love me, and I want people to praise me. And the problem is that if people don't love you and praise you for what you've done, then you get all bitter and resentful, right? But if you don't have any expectation, then it doesn't matter. That's true. Because I wasn't doing it for people to that's praise true, me. Yeah. I wasn't doing it for people to recognize that's me. Right. And that's how God functions. So God isn't, you know, desperately hanging out of heaven waiting for people to to be recognizing everything. He's he's moving uh, according to his will. He's giving the rain to the sinner and the non sinner. He's giving the sunshine to the sinner and the non sinner. God's functioning in that way. And uh, you set yourself up for a lot of discouragement and a lot of disappointment when you have an impure motive. That's it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if you can purify your heart from impure motives, then you're going to end up enjoying life a lot mm -hmm. more and being more satisfied. Blessed are you. That's right. That'll be the satisfaction of life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a heart definitely that's been defiled by immoral or ungodly thoughts. Um, a heart that's been defiled by bitterness and resentment, we talked about already. Unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment. But that really will twist and distort. That's why people end up rep representing the God of judgment without mercy. Instead of representing the God who judges with mercy and compassion with a full, pure balance. And so the, you, you show the wrath of God, but it's not the wrath of God at all. It's the wrath of the dragon. Okay. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 14, there's an interesting story where the elders of Israel come to Ezekiel and they say, we want to hear from God. We want to, can you seek God and tell us what is God saying? So Ezekiel seeks God and says, okay, God, what is it that you want to say to the elders of Israel? And here they are. The elders of Israel are coming to the prophet of God, the man of God that has the word of the Lord. Right? That's a good thing. And the leaders of the nation are asking the prophet, what is God saying? Well, we want direction from God. And you think that God would be really excited about this, right? And then God's not. And God says to Ezekiel, these men, they have idols in their hearts. And those idols become stumbling blocks to them as they try to walk on my path. You know, God is speaking for us to walk on a path. It's a path of God, the path of righteousness. But they've got idols in their heart that are going to become a stumbling block to them. And God says, I will answer, but I'm going to answer through the idol. And what that means is God answers you. This is God, 100% pure God, and God's word goes in your ear, and it goes through your heart. But you've got idols in your heart, right? And then what happens? The idol in your heart pollutes what God said. So... You know, when I was overseas, this happened a couple of times where there was this Christian young lady and she was really wanting to get married and she found this guy that was a, a Buddhist guy and the Buddhist guy really liked her and she liked him and they fell in love with each other, they said. And, um, and so she really believed that this is the one from God and she believed that she could win him over for Jesus, right? Famous last words. Anyway, so... Um, She's seeking God for confirmation that she's allowed to marry this Buddhist guy. And so she goes to this first pastor, and she's sitting down with the pastor, and the pastor gives her advice. He says, the Bible says clearly, you shall not be yoked together with an unbeliever. That's, That's clear. Right. 
New Testament. Old Testament. The people of God cannot yoke together with unbelievers. Sorry, I cannot marry you, nor can I give this relationship God's blessing. Because God won't give you his blessing. Mm, that's right. And so she went to the next pastor. And by the way, she took the Buddhist guy along with her as well. And uh, the next pastor said exactly the same thing. This is the word of God. You can't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. If he was to become a Christian, and if I was to see fruit that he is really a Christian, and not pretending to be a Christian just to marry you, mm. then I'll marry you and I'll give you the blessing. But if he's pretending to be a Christian just to marry you, I'm going to check, I want to see the fruit. And they didn't like that answer. So third pastor, same answer. So finally they found this Anglican pastor, you know, anyway, nothing against Anglicans, there's some good guys out there. But they found this pastor who said, Oh, God loves all men. This is awesome that you love each other. Yes, I'll marry you. If you do you love each other, yes, I'll marry you. And they go, oh, see, God has confirmed it through this pastor that we can marry. And, and then they told me the story. And I was just like, I was just laughing. Self-deception. The idol of the heart is so deceptive. That's Proverbs. It. The heart of man is deceptive above all things. That's when you have an idol in your heart, I'll tell you what, it twists and distorts and you mishear God. And the idol is speaking, and behind every idol there's a demon. The enemy is deceiving you and playing with you. And he's putting you on a wrong path. You're, you're going to be a, a stumbling block on the path to follow the Lord. And so they said, well, we got up in the morning and, you know... No, it's, it's in, in, in the afternoon. In the afternoon, and uh, it was getting starting to get dark outside. And they, so they, they prayed, God, give us a sign if you want us to get married. Give us a sign. So they walked out the front door, and it's just as it's getting dark, and all of the lights were turning on. You know how the lights turn on at night time because it's getting dark, right? And they walk out and all the lights, do, 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 do. oh, God has put a light to our path. <laughs> okay, so that's superstition, that's not faith. And especially in charismatic Pentecostal churches, it's amazing how, how much superstition is there. It's not God speaking, it's not a sign from God. Uh, it is just you so desperately that's wanting to, let, to have God let you do what you want to do that you'll find anything as proof. That's it. Um, and it's self-deception, and demons get involved with that. Mm. It's a stumbling block. So the pure in heart aren't seeing what God's doing, and they're not hearing from God because they've got an altar or an idol that needs to be cleansed in their heart. Are you following that? could be money. Money for some people. It, it's definitely the relationship thing in church circles. I'll tell you what, just... It's, the, it's one of the biggest things for singles. Um, you know, but I actually met a woman that, you know, she was married to a man. And then when she was married to the man, she met this other man. And God told her with, sign, with, with signs that she was going to marry the other man. And they're telling me this over a lunch after I spoke in church. And my, <laughs> my, I didn't have hair then either. And I'll tell you what, if I had hair, it would have just been all standing up on my head. It's just like, I was listening to this level of deception that's out there. Um... And so, purifying our hearts, removing every obstacle, every idol, every wrong motive. And, and, and ask God to show us, Lord, is there any idols in my heart? Mm. And here's one, here's one way to test it. If you really desire and want it, it's probably an idol. Mm. That's it. And so, just like Abraham, the only way to deal with it, you've got to go and get your idol. You know, he got his idol Isaac and he had to put his idol Isaac on the altar and put it to death. But the thing was, God gave it back because now the idol Isaac yeah. was put to death mm -hmm. and now he gets back Isaac with a pure heart. Pretty good, yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. They get a fame as sons of God. How's that? People look at these guys. These guys represent God. They're the sons of God. Mm. I can see God in them. Mm. I want to be one of those guys. Okay, so note that it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, not blessed are the peacekeepers. Mm. You know, like the United Nations sends out all the peacekeepers into all the war zones and they run around trying to keep the peace. Um, God doesn't bless peacekeepers. He blesses peacemakers. Mm. And so... The peacemaker is dealing with the ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. The ministry of reconciliation. In the book of Ephesians, it says that through the cross, Jesus has broken down dividing walls. So between God and men, 
there is the dividing wall of sin. That dividing wall of sin makes, puts men at enmity with God. It makes men enemies of God. And it makes God the enemy of the men. Mm. We become at enmity with God. God's our enemy because of sin. Okay? And so at the cross, Jesus broke down the dividing wall. But it has to be through Jesus. Because a wall is still there. But it's through Jesus that we have an open way to get to God. And that's why the scripture is always saying, The peace of God be upon you. The peace of God is dealing with this, that we are no longer enemies of God, whatever that wall is. And so the peacemakers are the ones that recognize in a believer's life that there can be issues that come. Now, definitely when you do evangelism and you're talking to an unbeliever and you're trying to bring them to Christ, that's a peacemaker. Okay, You want to bring them to the, to, to the Father through Jesus. But... In the Christian context, when we are talking to people, it's like the idols in the heart situation. Wherever those idols in the heart are, wherever there are sinful desires that they will not put to death, there starts to build between them and God a wall. And even though, yes, they're sons of God, yes, they're saved, but in their experience in life, their ability to receive the blessing of God gets limited. Their ability to feel His presence gets limited. Their ability to hear His voice, feel His joy. It all gets limited because now there's a new wall getting built. Jesus broke it by the cross, but now we need to keep breaking it down. So the, the peacemakers are the ones that speak into each other's lives and in humility and love, but challenge one another about ungodly behaviors about things that we need to put on the altar. Um, because what we want to do is we want to, we want to bring that person to peace with God so that they can get God's blessing. Okay? Um, again, the word peace here is, is the shalom. The word shalom, wellness of being, body, soul, and spirit. And so we want to bring into their life inner healing. We want to bring into their life deliverance. We want to bring into their life uh, spiritual freedom and liberty. We want them free from the guilt and shame. Because that guilt and shame starts to put a wall between them and God. You know, people are, Christians that are struggling with a lot of guilt and shame because they've been sinning and not repenting. Mm -hmm. and, and you see them in worship, they can't worship. Because mm -hmm. it's just, oh, I feel, I feel bad to be in the presence of God. You can even see extreme cases where people have to walk out of the service. Because that's the presence it, yeah. of God is making them feel so condemned. Mm, it's it. not that God is making them condemned. Their sin condemns that's them. Yeah, their conscience condemns them. They don't have a pure conscience before God. That's and so they pull back. And these are the people that can't be in the worship. You always see them. They have to sit right up the back or around the corner or something like that. Okay. So the ministry of reconciliation, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 20. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 20. So from now on, therefore... We regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ has reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation. So it's dealing with the fact that people are looking at each other in the flesh, through fleshly eyes, even looking at God through fleshly eyes. But we've got to learn how to, to look through the Spirit, the wisdom of the Spirit of God. And uh, it talks about us being new creations now because of through Jesus we're new sons of God. We're new creation sons of God. And we have a ministry of reconciliation. So we actually have an assignment to bring reconciliation between others and God. And wherever there is something broken down in their relationship, they're not connecting with God, they're not able to feel His presence, that we actually have a responsibility and a ministry to try to tear down those dividing walls, help them try to identify those things. Okay, 
it goes on. Um, that is, in Christ God was reconciled to the world, has reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. And the message of reconciliation is the message of the gospel. And so the message of the gospel is not just preaching, doing evangelism, but actually to one another. And it's the blood of Jesus that brings reconciliation. And that can only come through repentance. Okay, so let's go now back to Matthew chapter 5. Continue to look through the Beatitudes. Okay, so... We had verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And now um, here we have verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we're dealing with this issue of righteousness. What is right in the eyes of God? This is also according to God's definition, what is justice? Okay, what's just and right living? And so the first thing is, anybody that is really hungering and thirsting after God and His righteousness, they will be filled. In other words, that you have spiritual hunger. You know, people are looking for right things in wrong places. So that's why, you know, people that have a love deficit, and so in them there's like this love tank that's all empty. And they look at all the wrong people and all the wrong places mm. to fill up their love tank. Mm. And primarily, if you're looking to people to fill up your love tank, you're going to be, in the end, uh, sorely disappointed. And right. you're going to get rejected and hurt mm. and wounded. Because mm. you never primarily look to people. That's right. You primarily look to God. Yes. Okay? And so that's why your hunger and thirst after God and his righteousness and then all these other things scripture says will be added unto you so as people are anxious for the i want this and i want that and i you know i, 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 I want a girlfriend i want to get married or whatever and and so there's this constant uh lack of fulfillment in their lives but if you really pursue god and his righteousness at the right time he will give you all of those things that you really need but he'll give it to you in his timing and he can't actually um, give someone a marriage relationship who has not learned to be satisfied in their singleness. That's right. Oh, wow. Because they're always looking in their signal, singleness for a person to fulfill their need. Mm. And when they end up getting married, they find out there's no human that can really That's fully right. fulfill yeah. that need. Yeah. And then they're going to have the love with the hook and they're going to hurt that person and then that person will hurt them. That's and right. they're going to have a lot of fights. Yeah. Because they're looking for the right thing in the wrong place. Mm. And so you've got to learn how to be satisfied in the Lord. Mm. And so blessed are those that are hungry and thirsting for Him and His righteousness. That's the key to true contentment. Okay. So there is um, a number of other scriptures on this. Mm. Then blessed are those who have now been persecuted. For righteousness. So there's several things happening. We're pursuing righteousness. We're hungry and thirsting for it. But then now we're making a stand for righteousness and we start to suffer for righteousness sake. And Jesus says, well, when you're suffering for righteousness sake, you are being blessed. Oh, really? Yeah. When you're hungry and thirsting for righteousness, you're setting yourself up for blessing. And so scripture talks about this when we're going through trials, temptations, testings, consider it all joy. Because God is going to work this out. He's going to develop your faith. He's going to develop your character. When you're pursuing God and His righteousness in the midst of the storm, and you keep pursuing God and His righteousness, then you're linked in with God, you're in covenant with God, you're in the storm with God, and then God is going to use the storm to purify you. He will achieve His purpose. When you try to go through the storm by yourself, watch out. You get bitter, not better. And so, 
If we look in uh, the book of Peter, I think it's 2 Peter, just looking for my scriptures here. It's 1 Peter actually, chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. Mm. Okay. Now, who is there that will actually harm you if you're zealous for doing good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of those people, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ, for the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect and have a good conscience so that when you are slandered and those who revile you for good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. And so in this chapter, he's talking about two types of suffering. There's a suffering that happens because you've sinned. Mm. So there's, there's no blessed are those that suffer because they sin. It's like, well, you deserve this. Um, if you repent of this sin, then you can be blessed. But there's a special reward for those that are suffering in life because they're making a righteous stand. Okay, and you, you stand up and you speak truth. And for the sake of truth, people mock you or they oppose you. But because you're standing up for truth, there is a reward from God. There is a blessing from God. Now, here is the problem. In my Christian journey, I've met a lot of Christian people that are suffering in life and they're going through hardship. And they go, oh, it's the sufferings of Christ. And so I start to ask them some questions. Now, the suffering of Christ, if you go through the sufferings of Christ, it is a... Like it's the one of the most honourable things that a Christian could go through, and it has great reward. Mm. This is what they're talking about here: the sufferings of Christ has great reward. Being persecuted for His name's sake, great reward. But these Christians are oh, the sufferings are sufferings of Christ, and I talk to them why they're suffering. It's because they're being stupid. <laughs> it's because they're compromised with sin. They've had poor choices. That's it. And they've been foolish. Mm. I said, that's not the sufferings of Christ. That's the sufferings of being stupid. Repent. Stop doing what you're doing. Mm. Stop suffering because you're looking for love in the wrong place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Get your focus right. Mm. Okay? And, and, and it's a hard word, but there's a lot of suffering that we cause upon ourselves, and we cannot call that the sufferings of Christ. So we've got to, we've got to identify why we are suffering. And again, when you acknowledge I'm suffering because of wrong choices and then you repent and you get forgiven and then you start to make right choices, now, yes, there's blessing because now you're making right choices. And so the Lord can break the power of that suffering and blessing can come. But we're talking about there, there in life, Jesus was crucified on the cross, not for his own sin, but for our sin. It was the most pure, righteous act. And in spiritual warfare, it is one of the most powerful things to disarm the demonic powers is when a righteous man is suffering for righteousness' sake. That's where martyrs and witnesses come. The word martyr is where we get the word witness from, martreo. And this, you become a witness in the spiritual realm because you are making a stand. So that's a powerful thing. So blessed are those that are hungry and thirsting for this righteousness. They will be filled. So true fulfillment comes not by seeking yourself or seeking your own desire. Uh, it comes by seeking God and His righteousness. And then blessed are you when you are now suffering for righteousness sake. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. It goes on. So blessed are you when people revile you or persecute you or utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Okay, it's not because you've made mistakes in the workplace and you had a bad attitude and so now the boss is chewing you out because you've had a bad attitude. That's not the sufferings of Christ. That's the sufferings because you had a bad attitude before your boss 
or you've done poor work. Okay, and you can't go, I'm suffering for Jesus now. No, you're suffering because those things. But when it's for His name's sake, and you made a stand, that has got a great reward. Mm. And it goes on. Um, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Now this is something that we don't always see our reward in the earth. There is sowing and reaping. There are certain levels of reward that we will experience in this life. Uh, some of you know um, my one of my former pastors, spiritual father, Steve Nickel. Mm. Now he served God faithfully. He was a missionary in Thailand for six years. And then he came back to Australia. He's a pastor for more than 25 years in Australia. Uh, and, and so he's in ministry for a large, you know, 35 something years. Poured his life out into the church, poured his life out into missions, and then he got dementia. Mm. And I saw this great man, mighty teacher of the word, turn into a vegetable and, you know, um, didn't even recognize his own wife in the end. And, and so the, the, the question in his son's minds, and his sons fell away from the Lord out of the whole mm. thing. The question was, where is God's reward? He's been faithful serving the Lord. I talked to his wife. It's like, where is God's reward? We made such sacrifice on the mission field. We've done so serving him in ministry. Where is the reward? And I said, the reward is there for him in heaven. Mm. And when he died, I told his wife, I said, now he's entered into the fullness of his reward. And I said, dementia's gone. He's totally healed. Because they had a word that he'd be healed. I said, yep, he's healed now. He's in heaven. He's with the Lord. He's totally healed. No more dementia. And so there is a dynamic. Yes, in this life, there are rewards and blessings. Praise God. Mm. Don't have to wait till you die and get to heaven for some of it to happen. But ultimately, because you look at these stories mm. where people are martyred for their faith. Mm. And then people are saying, well, where is, where is God? Why didn't God protect their children? Mm. Their children were killed by the terrorists. You know, what, where, where is God? Has God no power? Well, you know, their children are up there you know, with their reward in heaven and they're being blessed in the heavenly realms and all sorts of stuff's going on now. In eternity, you've got to have an eternal perspective for these things. And so Jesus is trying to shift us. Don't just think about what you see happening in this life, in this world. Understand ultimately there is an eternal reward and blessing waiting for each one of us. And even if we're not seeing the fullness of it in this life, it will come. And then Jesus continues with that train of thought. He says, rejoice in the midst of the tribulation. Rejoice in the midst of the persecution. And he says, why? Because you know they also persecuted the prophets before you. Mm. In other words, they persecuted Jesus. They persecuted the apostles. You know, um, so you're, you're in good company. This is why they had to suffer. They went through the sufferings of righteousness sake. And that has great reward. So that's what we'll finish there tonight. We'll just finish with a word of prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we just want to ask that you would give us a greater understanding how to walk in these godly characteristics, these godly attitudes, uh, Lord, that are here in the Beatitudes. Lord, we ask that you would give us a greater clarity of understanding where we're not in alignment, where we have pride, where we're seeking fulfillment in the wrong people and the wrong places, where we have idols and altars in our hearts, Lord, where we're suffering because of our own silly lifestyle or our own wrong attitude. We ask, Lord, that the conviction of the Spirit would be there, that we could just remove these hindrances in our journey, these stumbling blocks, anything that's between you and us that we want to identify, we want to remove it, Lord, and... And we ask, Lord, that you would help us be those ministers of reconciliation, those peacemakers, that we could just be going to others and, and helping them in their journey to identify idols and altars and stumbling blocks as well. I want to tear down the dividing walls in their lives to see them, Lord, move into a greater place of blessing and fulfillment in life. In Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen.